Hi everybody, and I'm Dr. Adam Thiemann, back with you with Lecture 8 of the Digital VLSI Design course at Bar Ilan University. And in this lecture, we'll discuss the clock tree synthesis. So just as a reminder where we are in the design flow. Well, this is our whole design flow over here from design and planning all the way down to sign off tape out and finally physical validation. And um, we've synthesized our t design technology into the, uh, our design into a technology mapped gate level net list. Then we designed a floor plan for physical implementation and provide a location um, for each and every gate through placement. And here's a, a zoom in on our physical implementation, which will, will be um, actually with, uh, with us pretty much to the end of the course. Okay, and during all stages, we analyze the timing constraints and optimize the design according to these constraints. However, until now, we have assumed an ideal clock. In, um, this, uh, in this lecture, we're going to actually discuss, discuss what a real clock signal is. So we have all the sequential elements placed. We have our flip-flops around the design, and maybe we may have some hard macros that also have some sort of a clock input. And now we have to provide an actual clock signal to all of them. So what's the trivial approach to doing this? Why don't we just route the clock net just like any other net? Just bring it um, to each and every flip-flop in just a general way like we treat every other signal. Well, the, the, the answer is a, a, a multi-dimensional kind of an answer, and it has implications on timing, power, area, signal integrity, and other things, and we'll go into those in the next um, slides. So we'll now discuss the implications of clocking, timing, out, power, area, and signal integrity. So we'll start with timing. We just have to start by remembering our famous timing constraints that are an integral part of this course. And we have the max delay constraint, which takes our launch clock here that comes at the first flip-flop, and it goes through our TCQ plus our T logic, and we have to arrive at the arrival at the end point. Uh, our arrival time has to be shorter than the, the T, the um, uh, clock frequency plus whatever type of skew we have here on our clock and it has to be at least set up time before the clock arrives so that was our our um, uh, kind of our um, our first max delay equation our second equation was the min delay equation where we said that when we launch our clock we have to make sure that um, we don't skip a clock cycle by um, having the TCQ plus T logic be at least longer than without the big T at the same clock cycle longer than um, the delta skew uh, plus the hold time constraint of our flip-flop. And th that was our min delay constraint. So when we said that, we discussed uh, at least one parameter, which is uh, the skew. And the skew is defined as the difference in the clock arrival time at two different registers. So we have register A here and register B, and the clock is coming from the same place. One of these pads over here is driving the clock, and there will be some sort of a margin in between it. So if we kind of like look at this type of a, uh, of a um, uh, waveform, we have... Um, the signal that arrives at clock A and the signal that arrives at clock B uh, at uh, the clocking signal at uh, note at flip flop A and the clocking signal at flip flop B and we see that the um, clock arrives to flip flop B earlier than it does at flip flop A. That's what we call negative skew. So any type of a difference um, that is uh, uh, that is what um, uh, s th that's what our uh, skew is. And in this case, for example, we have this type of a compressed timing path because the, the, the clock arrived later at the launch clock and it ate away from our timing. Jitter, on the other hand, which we also briefly discussed, is a different kind of phenomenon. It's uh, the difference in, in clock period between different cycles. So we're now discussing the same flip-flop over here. And so, for example, if a flip-flop has a path that has a feedback to itself, then the skew is obviously zero because we're getting to the same point. But still, we do have a difference in uh, the phase of the clock when it arrives. So um, the, the, the jitter can arrive from all kinds of things. It is a difference in clock period over time because the actual clock edge doesn't arrive exactly at the same um, point that it did uh, the, the clock period before. Slew, which uh, is something we haven't exactly 
um, defined up till now, or we may call it transition time, is the, the T rise, the rise time or the fall time of the clock signal. So slew is an important thing, or transition time. And insertion delay is the actual time, the delay from the clock source until the register. So if our clock source was over here, the actual time it took to propagate the clock to each point, that's the insertion delay to that point. Uh, often we'll say insertion delay of the whole clock network as the average insertion delay to all the clock points. How do clock skew and jitter arise? Well, they can arise, first of all, from our clock generation, such as our PLL, um, which we'll discuss towards the end of the class today. Second of all, from the distribution network. So usually our PLL will be driving some sort of a central clock driver, and it will get into a distribution network, which will include buffers. And skew may arise because, for example, the number of buffers to each endpoint will be different. So the number of buffers, but also the variation in the buffers. So even if we have two buffers to this point, two buffers to this point, two buffers to this point, we'll still have variations, for example, in, um, in, in uh, manufacturing between the different buffers, and so they'll have different speeds. We have wire length variation, so even though we have two buffers to each point here, uh, possibly the wire length to each point will be different. The RC will probably be different, and that is another type of uh, variation. We also may have coupling, different coupling to other wires that are next to it, which cause some sort of a, an extra RC delay, and uh, different loads. So maybe the uh, load here is different for each wire, again, causing a different RC delay. Okay, and we have, of course, environmental variation. So we have, um, uh, when we discuss usually PVT, pow uh, which is process temperature and voltage, um, so the temperature can vary. So it may be different temperature over here and over here, which causes a, a difference in the speed of these buffers. And the power supply, there may be more IR drop to one point than another, which again will cause some sort of a variation. Here's a, a very old... Um, little graph by Intel, but this this is very system dependent and so forth. Um, but it's a 1998 uh, graph in an 0.25 micron process. And here is how the, they mapped out the, um, the, the uh, um, sources of skew and jitter. And here they showed it was mainly from due to device mismatch. But um, this is kind of a typical find, kind of thing that you could find, but it really does depend on your chip and so forth. So if we take that back and we go back to our um, to our equations, so we have a launch clock over here, and I'll draw um, a positive skew capture clock. So that means that our uh, capture clock arrives later than the launch clock, and that brings us positive skew. So the, the clock arrives here later than here, and the difference between these two points is positive skew. But it also could be the opposite, where um, the capture clock arrives uh, earlier than the launch clock, and in this type, uh, in, in this type of situation, we call it negative skew. Okay, and so when we look at our timing paths, so first of all, we have to take jitter, and jitter is a random phenomenon. So let's say we take a five percent jitter on the clock, and so it can be five percent later or five percent earlier. So I'm drawing around each of these clock edges. There is jitter in both directions. Um, now, when we want to go and uh, rethink what our max delay and our min delay are, so we look at our max delay, and the, the, the blue line is our max delay in the case of positive skew. And what we see is that due to the positive skew, we got an increased um, delay. We see that T plus delta skew, that means that this side of the equation will be larger. And so um, I, I drew it blue because positive skew actually helps us. On the other hand, when we have negative skew, this T plus delta skew when delta is negative, it makes our, our, our clock cycle shorter and it makes it harder to meet our timing conditions. In any case, what we see here is that in the worst case, uh, for, for, um, for, for both our positive and negative skew um, cases, the launch clock could have come out later because of uh, it could have risen over here and it could have been captured earlier. So what we do is that's uh, one delta jitter and two delta jitter. So we actually remove two delta jitter from our, um, from our launch path. So we come out with an equation that's T plus delta skew minus two delta jitter is bigger than our TCQ plus uh, T logic plus T setup plus extra margins that we'll discuss towards the end of the course. Okay. And, um, what that means is that jitter is always going to hurt us. It's going to hurt us really badly because we have to take the worst case since it's a random, um, it's a random phenomenon that comes uh, happens around our clock edge. Um, for the skew, 
positive skew will help our setup constraint and it will impede uh, 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 negative skew will impede our setup constraint. Looking at uh, Mendeley now, we see that obviously, I guess the opposite happens. That um, when we have a uh, positive skew, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a worst case. So we want um, now this side to be as small as possible, right? And uh, when we have positive skew, this delta skew is going to be larger, which is going to make it harder to meet this Mendeley constraint. On the other hand, when this is negative, it's going to be easier. So negative skew is going to be easier with um, uh, on hold, whereas positive skew is going to be harder. And that makes sense. If, if uh, positive skew helped us for the max delay, then it hurts us for the min delay and vice versa. Um, but one thing that we have to point out is that jitter, again, is, is a phenomenon that happens from clock cycle to clock cycle. So I basically um, like to not take into account jitter on hold and the reason is we're talking about the same clock cycle so if uh, if I'm looking at um, uh, the jitter that mainly maybe arises from the clock generation and clock distribution the the uh, trunk of the clock distribution network that is something that should that will not uh, change between clock cycles yes um, there is some jitter that arises due to temporal um, uh, changes in a, a, a in a spatial fashion so there may be a bit different in jitter from one clock cycle to another in the flip-flops but it's much smaller and for sure I would not say to take the minus two jitter which is often shown in different textbooks okay so that was our implication on timing let's go over the implications on power um, for that we have to remember our equations for uh, calculating dynamic power and dynamic power is basically the freak the clock frequency times the um, capacitance that is toggling times the voltage supply squared but what is this effective capacitance so we have to break it down and one way to break it down is saying some sort of activity factor times the total capacitance of the design and the activity factor is how much of the design is actually toggling in, uh, in an average clock cycle and we can further divide the activity factor into two things the activity factor of the clock network and the activity factor of all the other um, uh, nets and sometimes activity factor is taken for systems that may be 20 percent maybe even less 10 percent and it could be much further especially if we apply clock gating or so forth but the activity uh, factor of the clock cycle is basically a hundred percent on all clocks that are not gated so um, since this is 100%, anything that is the, in the C clock, this, this whole uh, factor is going to be large in the, in the equation. So since the activity factor of the clock network is high, we understand that every type of uh, capacitance that we have on the clock network is wasting quite a bit of power. When we look at the clock capacitance, what does it consist of? Well, first of all, we have the clock generation. So we have the PLL or the clock dividers or whatever is generating our clock and they're obviously um, consuming power. Then we have the clock elements. So we have the different bu buffers. We may have clock muxes or clock gates. They're also consuming some power. And we have the wires, the large RCs of the clock wires and they're consuming a lot of power. And then we have the load of the sequential elements. So the clock pins on the flip-flops are also um, part of the capacitance of the this part of this C clock over here. And just to, to, to summarize that clock networks are huge and therefore the clock is responsible for a large percentage of the total ship power. So um, actually this is another type of a chart. They sometimes show these in pie charts of how much uh, of the power uh, is consumed by different parts of a system. And this is just a, a general type of example. It is, I mean, it's uh, an example of a certain system that you could have 40% of the power be from the clocks, but there can be other systems where it can be even 80% and some other systems it could be as low as maybe 10%. So just, this is just kind of a, something to, to look at and get an idea of what could be. Okay, so that was uh, power. How about signal integrity? And we haven't mentioned signal integrity too much up till now in the course, but, uh, but um, it's an obvious requirement for the clock network. So noise on the clock uh, network can cause a bunch of things. First of all, in the worst case, it causes additional clock edges. Additional clock edges, that's blue screen of death. If we have an additional clock edge, we for sure have some sort of a setup or hold violation. We have problems and uh, our system will stop working, obviously. Um, but even if we have lower uh, coupling capacitance, 
we can still slow down or speed up the clock propagation depending on um, if the uh, clock signal is now rising and the signal and the, the signal it's affecting is rising or the clock signal is rising and the signal it's affecting is uh, falling and vice versa of course so if it's in the same direction it will speed up and if it's in the opposite direction it will slow down and that again will have implications on our timing uh, equations that we saw before. Another thing that we have to look at is that irregular clock edges can impede register uh, operation. So if you remember we had our in our lib files um, we had these lookup tables that took into account uh, you know uh, C load and here they had T rise or T fall of, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the of the of the input and for a um, for a flip flop we have TCQ over here which we want to figure out so uh, the club and for T setup and T hold as well so the C over here is the T rise and T fall of the clock network and if we're too long then we'll be somewhere over here maybe even out of the table and if we're too fast we'll be somewhere over here maybe even out of the table and then our models won't be correct and anyway it'll make our hold or, um, or, or set up or TCQs uh, be less than, uh, less than optical. Okay, so when we look at slow clock transitions, so we have a high slew rate, okay, so then it's going to also make our clock very susceptible to noise. So if you have a, um, a slow slew rate, in other words, if your uh, signal is going really slowly, that means that the driver of the signal is small, driving a big, big uh, capacitance or a big RC. And uh, that means that our, we have a weak driver and that's not good because then any type of coupling to that signal can easily um, really affect it. So that's bad. And uh, as I said before, we're going to have poor in the TCQ, T setup, and T hold due to the uh, uh, the um, the dependence of our of our parameters here on on the slew rate of our input. If our transitions are too fast, well, that means we had a really big um, driver over here. So we had some over design and this driver is going to cost us in terms of power area, etc. And the other thing is if we have another signal over here and the clock is an aggressor to it, this type of a, a, of a very sharp transition is going to have a large effect on this guy and maybe cause it to have some noise. So um, as a kind of a, a, of a summary, what we should do is um, we should have some sort of a, um, a best practice to keep T rise and T fall between 10 to 20 percent of the clock period. So it should be like 100 to 200 picoseconds at a one gigahertz clock. Um, so uh, and just another point over here, we saw in our standard cell libraries that our our clock elements they're um, balanced. So T uh, TPLH uh, kind of equals TPHL. Um, and uh, T rise kind of equals T fall at the output and and that uh, actually helps us keep the skew lower than if it were different and we cause larger um, differences. Okay, so um, our uh, that was a uh, signal integrity and our final implication is on area and uh, the clock network we already discussed it consists of clock generators, clock elements, and clock wires, and all of these consume area. So clock genera generators such as PLLs can be very large. They're often kind of an analog, hard, uh, hard macro, and they can be really large depending on how much jitter you want and what, what kind of functionality you want from it. Um, clock buffers are distributed all over the place, so they take up a lot of area. And clock wires uh, consume a lot of routing resources, which it may make us have to uh, um, have lower utilization in our placement. And just as an example here, in the Intel Itanium, 4% of M4 and M5 was used for clock routing. Okay, routing resources are often the most vital part of this. Um, the routing requires to have low RC for transition and power um, implications, and um, that's why we're going to try to use high and wide metals. Okay, for for the clocks, um, and we just have to remember that we have to connect every single clock element, every flip flop, every uh, macro clock input, and th that means that this clock network is going to be have to be distributed all over the chip. We can see here some sort of an example here from uh, Bonn, uh, where they have the clock network and all the, the the clock sinks that are all over the chip. And if we have a higher metal um, driving. If we use their high wide metals, we have to take this via stack that goes all the way down until it reaches the uh, the the sink or the buffer that it's uh, that is driving. So we finished our implications on clocking, and now we're going to go over into into clock distribution or how do we build an actual clock tree. So 
let's discuss the clock routing problem. We have a source where the clock comes from and n sinks where the clock needs to go to. In this case, we have four flip-flops that it needs to go to. What we need to do is connect all the sinks to the source by an interconnect network, trying to minimize the clock skew, trying to minimize the delay, trying to minimize the total wire length, and trying to minimize the noise and coupling effect. Our goals basically are to minimize the skew, and we also want to meet a target max insertion delay. Okay. So the challenge is that we need to synchronize millions, maybe even billions of separate elements. And we have to do this in a time scale of picoseconds, like tens of picoseconds. The distances can be as much as like two to four centimeters on a really big chip. Um, so the ratio of synchronizing distance to the element size is on the order of 10 to the fifth. And just as a reference, light travels less than one centimeter in 10 picoseconds. So we're talking about something really, really, really hard to do. Um, we usually discuss the clock tree constraints or uh, the, the, as maximum transition, maximum load cap, maximum fan out, and maximum buffer levels. So that's, that's basically the problem that we're trying to solve. And I just want to mention a couple technology trends that come along with advanced technology. So when we look at timing, um, we obviously are always trying to get higher clock frequencies. And when you get a higher clock frequency, we probably want lower skew because we have to meet those max and min delays. Um, again, this higher clock frequency, it also brings us faster transitions. And what about jitter? Well, PLLs have gotten better with CMOS scaling over time, which is good, but we have other sources of noise that increase, such as the power supply noise is more important because we have lower uh, voltages and we have uh, switching dependent temperature gradients. What about new interconnect materials? Well, the introduction of, uh, I mean, the introduction of copper interconnects. So they provided us with lower RCs, which gives us be uh, better slew and potential skew. And you can see here that with aluminum, we had larger delays uh, going into copper. Not only were the delays larger, but the spread was smaller, which is a much better thing. It can provide us better uh, skew. Okay, locate dielectrics that were introduced as the interlayer dielectric that divides between the, um, the interconnects. That gives us lower clock power because we have less capacitance and better latency, skew, and slew rates. Okay, it also gives us better coupling capacitance, right? Um, and power, well, when we go to heavily pipeline designs to get better throughput, that means we have more registers, more registers, more capacitive load for the clock. Larger chips, well, larger chips, that means more wire length that needs to cover the, that we need to cover the whole die. Um, finally, we talk about complexity. Uh, complexity means we have more functionality, more devices. That probably means we have more clocked elements. And if we discuss something like dynamic logic, which isn't used as much anymore, then really all the elements had to be clocked. So how are we going to solve this problem? We'll take different approaches to clock tree synthesis, and we have this broad classification into three categories. The first one is what we mentioned, what we'll call a clock tree, and this is called clock tree synthesis because what most of us will be doing is building a clock tree, some sort of tree. It has some sort of root is the source of the clock. It's divided into different buffers that are divided into lower level buffers that finally meet the clock sinks at the end. There's a, a different approach that we'll discuss called a clock mesh or a clock grid, where we have this big type of a mesh that covers the whole chip, and then we can just hang the sinks off of it. And we have some sort of kind of intermediate solution, which we call a clock spines, where we have the source driving different like spines of the clock tree, which then um, we can have the, uh, the, the flip-flops hanging off of. So let's go and discuss all of these. We'll start with clock trees. So the naive approach of a clock tree is, okay, we have these clock sinks. Why don't we just route one single net to each one? And we'll balance the RC of this, these nets. We'll make sure that this uh, line and this line, they all have the same exact length and so, so forth. Is that a good idea? Well, um, probably not. It would burn very excessive power because each one of these lines separately would uh, lead up to a very, very large capacitance. Um, and there would be lots of signal integrity issues because we'd have a lot of these lines that would be running next to each other and running next to the signal that would also take up a huge amount of our routing resources. Anyway, it's not really feasible. But uh, uh, so we would, what we would want to do is probably replace that with the buffered tree where each part of this is driven by uh, uh, one or another buffer that drives more buffers and so forth. Um, 
this is much better solution because shorter nets each of these nets would be shorter and they that means they have lower rc values each of these buffers restores the signal providing us with better slew rates and uh, the total insertion delay actually goes down because the rc to drive a longer net um, is really bad it actually um, increases uh, squared and we'd have less total switching capacitance because we have less rc so that's what we're going to do. We're going to build things with uh, buffered trees. And uh, how are we going to do that? So the best way or one of the best like kind of uh, approaches to it, theoretical approaches, is to build what we call an H tree. So if you see here, we have this clock source and it drives a, a buffer that drives an H. And the H means that at the end of each H, the distance from the source to each one of these points was exactly equivalent. So our RC is exactly equivalent. Then we put each one of these buffers will drive another H and each one of these buffers will drive another H and so forth until we get to our flip-flops at the end and then we know that the RC is completely balanced. So we have this one large central driver and we have a recursive H style structure to match the wire lengths. Um, we have uh, the wire width at the branching points to reduce the reflections. Okay, but it's not really uh, feasible because our flip-flops aren't at each point here that's at the end of, uh, of the H tree. Uh, kind of a more feasible approach would be to do something like a tapered H tree, where we'd have one of these bigger, like wider uh, wires with a huge buffer off of it. The buffer would uh, drive uh, wide wires, but not as wide, which would, be, would drive a bit smaller buffers, which would drive, again, going down and down in the size of the buffers and size of the wires until we get to these local buffers where each local buffer would drive a certain number of flip-flops that could be in a certain area. Again, this is still hard to do because in a certain area, we would need a certain number of flip-flops that would be similar for each area of the chip. And that probably is not going to happen, especially if we have different macros around the chip and different types of logic. Um, and these heterogeneous types of chips don't provide similar numbers of uh, flip-flops in every area. So that, that brings us to the standard CTS, standard clock tree synthesis approach. Um, since the flip-flops aren't distributed even, evenly, what we'll try to do is build a tree that will be balanced, but um, th this assumes that we don't have to be perfectly balanced because we assume that what happens is that when we have two flip-flops that are next to each other, um, they're in the same kind of a, a module, they'll be talking to each other, there'll be lots of paths between flip-flops that are close to each other, well, they're probably hanging off the same branch of the tree, and then the skew will be low anyway. Um, when we have a bit uh, farther away modules, but they'll probably still be close together if they have a lot of paths between them. So we have some sort of medium type of skew and jitter between these areas. We have very few paths probably from these modules over here and these modules that are very far away. And then we'll have skew and uh, we'll have to probably try to fix it. But um, that's kind of a, a standard CTS approach that's more feasible. So. An H tree is a great idea, and uh, it's been done before. Um, it's been tried to be done. So IBM uh, showed this at ISSCC 2002 uh, or 2000. They have their PowerPC architecture, which had these H trees, and you can really see the H's here in their conceptual design, but it had to still go around all kinds of obstacles and strange things like that. Um, uh, uh, a kind of a picture that uh, appears in CMOS VLSI design is the Itanium 2 and you can see uh, again some sort of routing which is kind of whatever um, uh, looks kind of like H's in some way or another but it's very far from being a real H tree. So we have this problem that we reach this high skew and so we could take a different approach which is to build a clock grid. So what we see here is we have this clock driver which is a tree a uh, really big tree, it could be even an H tree, no problem, that brings this huge driver um, that then um, drives this type of a mesh or a grid. And the mesh spans the whole tree, and it's a really equipotential type of area of, uh, of nets. And then in every place that we need to add a flip-flop, we just connect it to the grid, which is there and gets the uh, equipotential tree. And it doesn't matter if we have you know a few flip-flops here and a lot here or opposite, or we don't have one here and we do have one here. Still, every point on the mesh will be pretty much skew-balanced. 
So this has a real big advantages. The skew is determined by the grid uh, density and not overly sensitive to the position of the actual loads. The clock signals are available everywhere, so we don't need to go and bring some buffers and distribute the clock to an area. It's already there uh, based, uh, based on the fact that we have the grid everywhere. Okay, it's very tolerant to process vari uh, variations and usually yields extremely low skew values. However, this costs a lot in terms of wiring and power. It takes up at least a whole, um, uh, basically, uh, layer of routing, um, which can be really expensive and infeasible to do. And the power is huge because the, the, the C of this, the capacitance of this is just huge. So we have a large wire cap. We need really, really, really strong drivers. And we'll see in the next uh, slide just how big the drivers have to be to, to drive this whole capacitance and get good transitions. And it, it just takes up a lot of uh, routing area. So to minimize all these pen penalties, what you could do is make the grid less dense, uh, make the pitch coarser, but then your skew gets worse and you lose the main advantage of this approach. So how can you do it? You can not over design and let the skew be as large as tolerable, but um, it just is not feasible for real uh, SOCs. Let's just take a look at when this was done. And uh, one of the places was in the Digital um, uh, Electronic Corporation. They had the alpha architecture and they had different generations of their alpha chips. And uh, starting with the EV4, the 21064 in 1992, what they did is they made this big central clock driver. So if we look, we can see here in the layout, there's this big driver, or we can see it in the conceptual layout over here. It, that's just one big buffer. Okay, and when we take clocking, you can often find uh, different websites and things that will show you how uh, clocking happens in different cool uh, depictions. Here's a 3D graph of um, how we can see the hotter it is, the worse the skew is. And you see that in the middle, the skew is very low. But as you go farther out towards the sides of the chip, you see that the skew gets a, a, a lot worse. Um, and that that's obvious because the farther you get from the drive where the driver is your skew will get worse Even though it's all still covered with a grid because you still have to drive that grid But we just want to look at that. So this was in a, in a 0.75 micron uh, Technology the chip ran around 200 megahertz had uh, around a million and a half transistors um, It had this big central driver and a clock grid and it reached 240 picoseconds of skew so um, the guys at Digital, they went a step further, and in the next generation, the EV5 in 1995, already they went up and down to an 0.5 micron process. They went up by 50% on their um, frequency, and they had nine times more, four, four to nine times more transistors. And, uh, and here they went, and they did this in a two-stage. So they had their central driver, their main driver, pre-driver, and it was driven out to the sides in these final drivers which meant that our distance to our farthest away uh, blocks was reduced by at least half, okay? So each of these guys had to drive uh, a lot less of a distance. Uh, our, our largest uh, way was a quarter of a chip away, okay? And then when we look at the skew type of, uh, we have the, the low skew, the zero skew, basically at the place of the drivers where they drive the grid, but as we go further out, we get higher skew, even though, and maybe these are the worst areas, right? Um, it's not that bad. We get down to half of the skew we had before, so 120 picoseconds, but the total driver size, if you take the, this blue guy and these red guys, and we, um, we fit them together, we, we add up the total width of the drivers, we have 58 centimeters. That's not a mistake. That's 58 centimeters of width. So that is very a very, very big buffer or few buffers, okay? Um, they went even further with, uh, in 1998, the EV6, the 21264. Um, it's, again, uh, a, more, uh, a more scaled technology, 0.35 micron. It already doubled the frequency at 600 megahertz and, again, almost doubled the number of transistors at 15.2 million transistors. And what they did here is they built a clock tree that um, went to four corners of the chip and uh, drove these uh, four drivers around each of these corners. So each of these drivers now drove a clock grid in this corner and uh, made a nice skewing area. And you can see it here where you have the little skew areas of the chip around here where we have a, a very low skew at the sides where that are driving these these guys these four big drivers here but again the area for the drivers was huge 40 centimeter total driver size but they were able to get down the skew to a very low 75 
uh, picoseconds. So again, the problem with that is that clock grids are really too power and routing hungry to use. So a different approach is to what, use what's called spines. And in spines, we'll decide on um, some areas, some spines, some um, lines here, where we'll have, they're kind of like these drivers, which will route our uh, clock tree to it with some sort of type of H tree or balanced uh, buffering design. So each of these areas will be pretty much skew balanced, but from there, we'll build our local distribution off of the spines, which are pretty much equipotential. Um, you can see that in the Pentium 4 here, um, we had these uh, spine areas. So there are three spines, that's actually uh, the layout of this schematic over here. So we have these three spine areas, which we can take the clock off of. Okay, um, at later Penny and Fours, they even use more spines. So you have these, like really a lot of these spines, which you can de decide on really making the uh, skew to them um, equ equivalent, but then you can just get uh, your clocks from them to, to each flip flop. Okay, so um, that's a, a more kind of practical approach. It doesn't get as good. Uh, um, skew uh, uh, skew results, but let's summarize the main uh, distribution approaches. So here's a little um, table that tells us what we can get. And when we when we take an H tree, what we're going to get is pretty good skew. Um, and we're also going to get really low capacitance area and power. It's really a nice approach. The problem is the floor plan flexibility is very low, which makes it pretty much impractical to actually carry out as is. If we take a clock grid, grid or a mesh, we're going to get the best skew. We're going to get really, really low skew. And the floor plan flexibility is excellent. We can just hang off a, a flip-flop anywhere uh, um, around the chip. The problem is that the capacitance area and power are just um, inconceivable. Okay. And um, finally, we can take this uh, median solution, which is a clock spine, where we're going to get okay uh, cap area and power, okay floor plan flexibility, but our skew isn't going to be great. So there's another approach which is often uh, now taken into account in uh, in bigger systems, especially system on chips, and it's called active skew management, de-skewing, or something like that. So then the EV7, this is what they did. They decided, okay, we're going to make different skew areas. So we know that these areas, they're going to be talking to each other, they're going to be, uh, but they're mainly going to be self-sufficient. So we'll decide that we're going to have a clock grid over this area, we're going to have a clock grid over this area, this area, and this area, and now we don't actually have to have them uh, sit on the same tree. What we can do is we can put a uh, DLL in between them and we can make sure that we fix the phase between each of these areas and de-skew um, uh, de them. But we'll build the clock grid separately, lowering the complexity of each clock grid. And that's a way to do it. I'll explain to a DLL up towards the end of the class today. Okay. Um, and a similar approach is uh, Intel Itanium and every company kind of calls this stuff uh, uh, in their own way, especially Intel tends to make up uh, names that are different from the rest of the industry. So they called these DLLs uh, DSKs or de-skewing elements. And what they have here is their PLL that drives a bunch of these de-skewing elements, which each one of them drives this regional grid, which uh, can ha have flip-flops hanging off of it. So it's a very similar approach to what they did here in the Alpha. And that's how it was done in the Itanium. But I am... Uh, ripping up my piece of paper here and throwing it away, and I'll introduce something else. Um, but I want to ask you, what is the main goal of clock tree synthesis? So we're trying as hard as we can to minimize skew. That's what all of the previous slides did. We're trying to minimize skew. On the way, we're burning power, we're wasting area, we're really suffering from high insertion delay, and, et cetera. But is minimum skew our actual goal? I mean, why do we want to make minimum skew? Why are we minimizing skew in the first place? And that takes us to this nice um, little chart I found here on the internet somewhere that says that there's this uh, circle here of things that matter. There's this circle here of things you control. And we should really focus on kind of the uh, part that we can control that matters. We shouldn't be focusing on things that we can control that don't really matter. So why are we trying to minimize skew? Let's see if we can forget what we, we actually want to do. Our real goals are not skew. Our real goals are meeting timing. We have our um, set up and hold uh, paths, our set up and hold equations. That's what we want to meet. And we also want to meet our DRV constraints, DRV being uh, design rule violations, uh, like the, our minimum, uh, our maximum uh, fan out or our maximum capacitance and uh, maximum transition and so forth. Those are the things that we want to meet on our clock tree. In fact, the reason that we actually are trying to, uh, to um, 
to minimize skew is because we didn't take skew into account at all pre clock tree synthesis and we met our timing and so forth and we want to go and make our clock tree and keep our ideal type of a clock and our ideal type of a clock will mean that there's no skew it won't actually affect what we uh, calculated before but that was our goal but is it worth this power area and high insertion delay that we were hitting um, so again, minimizing skew is just to correlate the post-CTS and pre-CTS timing. But maybe we should just consider timing while building our clock tree and try to fix this. So this is an approach that Cadence uh, takes into account when they use their what they call the clock concurrent optimization. And it's a completely different approach than um, the, the, the zero skew approach that we have, uh, CTS that we've been discussing up till now, and which is our traditional way to build a clock tree. So what is clock concurrent optimization? What is the methodology of CCOP? First, we're gonna build a clock tree and fix DRVs. So we have our N sinks that we discussed before. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go and buffer our clock net in order to meet our max fan out, max capacitance, max transition constraints, okay? After we do that, we're gonna check timing, we're gonna check setup and hold, and if there are any violations, we're gonna fix them. That's basically our methodology for CCOPT. And why is this a good approach? Well, most of the timing paths are local. Remember this little chart I showed you before? All of these guys, that's where most of the timing paths are going between them. And they're gonna be getting their um, clock source from you know, one of these buffers or, or a set of buffers that aren't far away. So the skew between them won't be high, and therefore we probably won't run into that big of setup and hold violations due to skew, and maybe we can overcome them with some sizing and, and, so, and some optimization. Um, the, the, the number of kind of paths that we have that are actually crossing all these, there aren't that many of them. So we can just look at them and try to fix them uh, according to what we need using type of things like useful skew, adding some skew on the, uh, on the clock uh, in order to fix either a setup or a hold violation. So if we don't do skew balancing, which is what is being proposed here, we'll have a lower insertion delay because our insertion delay is not set by our worst, um, uh, our farthest away type of flip-flop. It's set by however we need to just fix the DRVs to get there. And that, if we have less insertion delay, it means we have less RC. Less RC is less power. It also means we have less jitter because jitter is caused by the number of elements that we have along the way, and we have less elements, so we get less jitter, and that's good. We have fewer clock buffers, right? Fewer clock buffers means we have uh, less power and less area that they take up. The distribution of peak current is this kind of a non-trivial approach that we can see. Well, if we look at a digital system over time, what we're gonna see here is uh, if we look at the uh, power consumption or the current consumption, what we're gonna see is every once in a while we're gonna have this like uh, rise. Now, what is that rise in power? That's when our clock rises, right? So if a clock rises, uh, we'll probably have something like that. Right? When our clock rises at these points, what's going to happen is our flip-flops are going to uh, sample whatever was here, move it over to the other side. This is going to go uh, travel through our, uh, our, our um, combinational uh, stuff and get to our next flip-flop. Right? Then things are going to sit statically until the next clock rise. So everything is really going on right here. And that's here where we, we first sample our stuff, which takes a lot of current, and then we start driving it through our sequential elements until we get to kind of a steady state where we're not wasting much power. Okay, That's really bad because it means that our peak power is really high. If we're not skew balanced, then this clock edge is actually scattered all around, right? And then we'll have smaller little peaks that are scattered all around and our peak power gets much lower. We're going to still probably have the same average type of power except for the difference in, in the power on the clock tree, but, but our, our peak power is going to go down and that's really nice. It also it leads to less IR drop and so forth. And finally, um, we're going to use a heavy dose of useful skew. So as I said before, useful skew is actually skewing the uh, clock that gets to each of the flip-flops in order to help our setup and hold constraints. And we can reach higher f clock frequencies, for example, by using useful skew rather than the traditional approach of useful skew, which meant let's first balance our clock tree and then we'll maybe incrementally add a bit of useful skew to improve to maybe reach a higher timing target. Okay, 
Um, that leads us to our Chip Hall of Fame chapter of, of this lecture. And here, since we already decided to discuss uh, the, the deck alpha in some of the previous slides, I, I just it's a really important type of an architecture that came up. They introduced a ton of novelty in, in Digital Equipment Core. Um, and it included st things like clocking that we discussed here. So the alpha architecture and the first chip that uh, the first alpha chip that deck put out was this 21064. And w why did they call it this strange name? So I think that's a cool thing. Well, it was a 21st century ready 64 bit zero generation architecture. So that's why it's called the 21064. Um, it was released in 1992. It was a 64 bit architecture. The architecture was called alpha. Okay, and the process was their own. The Dex uh, Fabs were making a, a CMOS 4 process, they called it, and it was an 0.75 micron process. It had three metal layers. They used the 3.3 uh, volt power supply, and the, the chip ran up to about 200 megahertz. It had one and a half million transistors or so. It had 232 millimeter die size, and it was priced at the low price of only $3,000, right? So at the time of introduction, the alphas were the world's fastest chips. Um, every generation that came out was faster than the, the last one, and they were really groundbreaking. They were really leading the pack. Um, De uh, DEC was an acquired by Compaq in 1998, and little by little, uh, Compaq decided to phase out the alpha architecture and chose to use the Intel Antanium architecture instead. Um, I just wanted to mention that the DEC Alpha has not yet been inducted to the IEEE Chip Hall of Fame, but I imagine that one day it will be. So now we'll go over to see how clock tree synthesis is done in our EDA tools. So just our starting point before CTS, we have to remember that our design is placed and therefore we know the location of all the clock sinks, the register and macro clock pins. All the clock pins are driven by a single clock source. There may be multiple clocks, but uh, let's discuss each one separately. And until now, we've, uh, we've considered them as ideal. Um, as I said, we may have several clocks and some logic on the clock network, such as clock gates, muxes, clock dividers, etc. We better know about them and we better understand them very well. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to have to buffer the clock nets in order to meet the DRV constraints. And as I said uh, several times, DRV stands for Design Rule Violations in the Cadence Tools. And it me it's in a different name for Max Fan Out, Max Capacitance, Max Transition, and Max Length. So we're going to define those types of... Uh, of uh, constraints and we're going to have to meet them. So we're for sure not going to um, drive 10,000 flip-flops with one net, but because we have a max fan out of 25 or something like that. Okay, and second, we're going to try to meet the clocking goals, which are the minimum skew that we require and the minimum insertion delay. Um, in many of the following slides, I'm not going to be discussing CC opt because it, it makes a kind of a, a strange um, relation to all these things. I'm going to be discussing our zero skew uh, approach where we're trying to do skew balancing that will usually um, have these definitions pretty much uh, coherent. Uh, for CC opt uh, specific um, addressing of these issues, you should look into the cadence manuals. So just some basic understanding. What makes, a, uh, what makes up a clock tree? Well, we have to have a starting point. That's the point, uh, the port or the output pin of the clock generator where the clock is sourced from. We're going to have leaf or endpoints. Those are clock pins of the registers, memories, etc. We're going to have buffers and inverters that are required to ensure a clock transitions and meet skewer requirements. And we may have some special logic on the clock, such as multiplexers, integrated clock gates, clock dividers, etc. Okay, what we need is some sort of a language to define these. We need to be able to speak with each other and describe these things with some sort of a common uh, uh, lingo, common syntax. Um, so the following slides are going to introduce you to what is used in the, in the CC opt engine, in the cadence tools, how the naming conventions are called for these elements, and here's just a little bunch of them over here in the top right corner. So let's start with sources and sinks. So a clock source is the pin that the clock fans out from, okay? So a clock source can be a primary input to our design, an output pin of an IP such as a PLL, and an output pin of a gate such as a clock mux or a clock gate. So let's see these over here. If we have a clock port coming to the design, that could be a clock source, okay? Um, maybe we have a PLL, so the output of the PLL that drives the clock, that could be a clock source. And maybe we have some sort of clock mux, for example, that we get two different clocks and we have some sort of selection uh, register that or, or input that decides which clock we're using. So we may define the output of that as our clock source. 
a clock sync on the other hand. Those are all the pins that receive the clock signal. So all of these guys are basically the clock sinks. These are usually the input, the clock inputs of a register. That's the flip-flops and the latches. Um, the clock inputs of an IP. So, for example, an SRAM has a clock uh, input, and that'll be a clock sync. And sometimes a primary output um, will be a clock sync if this clock is driven to an output of the design. Um, it doesn't happen that often, but it can be depending on what type of block we're working on. So our next definition is what's called a clock tree in the cadence tools. So the clock tree is the root of a circuit graph for buffering. Okay, so this whole thing is the clock tree, but it's defined as the root of the clock. Everything that downstream from it, there are clock sinks. So that's a clock tree. Um, then again, there's something else called a skew group, which is a separate entity, and that's a subset of clock sinks that are considered for skew balancing or analysis. By default, all the sinks of a clock tree are in the same skew group. So if we want to balance all of these guys, okay, then they would be considered a skew group. And usually when we're going to define a clock tree, all the sinks that it drives are together in the same skew group. But they don't have to be. So you can divide it into different ways. For example, we can define that this is one skew group and this is another skew group. They were, will be considered as one entity and these guys will be considered a different entity. They still do maybe belong to the same clock tree because they receive their clock from the same clock source. Okay. Um, I know that was kind of confusing, but there can be very complex situations when these types of things are needed. So the basic ccopt commands that describe this are create clock tree. That defines this thing as the clock tree. Um, if you don't add this minus no skew group, then automatically with the same name that we used here, clock, we'll have a skew group that will include all of these flip-flops. Okay, but you can also do it with this minus no skew group and then separately create a skew group and give it a name which may be the same name that says which clock sinks are there if we use this minus auto sinks then everything that comes out of this source will be added to the skew group so usually we just use create clock tree not put this minus no skew groups and these two commands would be together but sometimes we'd want to actually separate the two okay and if we'd want to add or specify a special thing that you know, comes to the skew group we'd use this update skew group command and then we could add sinks like this certain clock pin of a certain flip-flop we could add it to this skew group okay now specific pins on the clock tree well we'll start with stop pins so um, when we this uh, beforehand we said that there's the leaf or the sink of a clock tree right and uh, that's where the clock actually stops propagating in other words when our clock goes down it goes through this buffer and it gets to this um, uh, clock pin here but Afterwards, we have all kinds of logic. The clock net does not go through this logic, so it stops at this pin. So the clock sinks, the, the flip-flop uh, uh, clock pin, that's an implicit stop pin. Okay, but it's, all, it's called a stop pin by the tool. That's what we call it, an implicit stop pin. So all clock sinks are implicit stop pins, and therefore they will be considered for skew balancing and analysis. But we can also define different things as a stop pin. Let's say for some reason we would want to do skew balancing up to this point, so we could define this pin, the A pin of an inverter uh, or a buffer, as a stop pin, and then the, the clock will not propagate beyond this. The way to do it is we use a set DB command to a certain pin, like say this is called inverter A, inverter 1 I mean, and the uh, pin here is called A, so pin inverter 1A, we'd use this property dot CTS sync type, and we'd call it a stop pin. And that will be a stop pin. These guys would not be sinks anymore, the guys who are downstream from it. Okay. Um, similarly, we have something called an ignore pin. An ignore pin are pins on the clock that will not be considered a sink in any skew group. For, so, for example, let's say we have a clock tree that has on it an, a, a primary output. And what we do not want to do is we do not want to skew balance these guys with the output over here because the output is going to be driven outside the, the, the block or outside the chip. And it has nothing to do with the skew balancing, possibly, of these guys. So we want to say ignore it. We still want to um, fix all the, the DRVs up to it, but we just want to say ignore that guy. And in fact, um, a, a primary output is an implicit ignore pin. So if we want to um, define an ignore pin, we use the same type of a syntax as up here, set DB, we give the name of the pin, and we call it a CTS sync type ignore. The next one is called an exclude pin. An exclude pin is similar to an ignore pin, but the clock net will not be buffered up to an exclude pin. So there may be a reason that we want to uh, exclude a certain pin from the uh, clock tree. 
Finally, there's something that used to be called the through pin, which is a pin that the uh, would otherwise be considered as a stop pin. So for example, um, the clock input of a clock gate would be a stop pin implicitly because it's a clock pin of a latch, of a register. But um, we want the clock to propagate through it. Okay, so we would call it a through pin. Now it seems that in the newer versions of Inovis, this has been removed and now we just call it an ignored pin, but it can often be called a through pin as well. Uh, the final type of uh, clock pin is called an insertion delay pin in cadence tools. Um, so in some cases, we want to provide a clock to a certain pin, uh, uh, stop pin earlier or later than the average insertion delay. So for example, if a macro block has some uh, internal insertion delay, we'd like to provide the clock early for skew balancing. So for example, in this graph, this is the direction of insertion delay, and we have all of these flip-flops that are skew balanced, and we have this macro maybe uh, it's either a, a hard or soft macro that we have here, and um, we can't play along with it, but we know we're given that the insertion delay of this block is X. So what we want to do is we want to provide the clock here at um, whatever, let's say this is T, so we want to provide the clock here at T minus X in order to have the clock reach uh, this guy and these guys at the same amount of time. Um, so that is a kind of common situation. So for this type of thing, it's also known as a float pin in synopsis tools. What we're going to do is, if we want to provide the clock to an SRAM called MEM 150 picoseconds earlier than the average insertion delay, we're going to do set db pin mem slash clock dot cts pin insertion delay 150 picoseconds. That will bring it at t, the t, which would be our uh, average insertion delay minus 150 picoseconds. So to sum that up, we have a uh, table here. It shows stop pins, ignore pins, exclude pins, and float or insertion delay pins. And um, which ones are part of the clock tree? So only exclude pins are not part of the clock tree, and only exclude pins will not be actually considered for DRV fixing. Um, include, exclude and ignore pins will not be considered for uh, delay balancing, and float pins will be um, uh, balanced at, uh, according to the constraint earlier or later than the average insertion de and delay. But uh, the clock does not propagate beyond this. Maybe nowadays with these ignore pins, it will propagate uh, beyond. Okay, um, so what about routing? clock nets. Clock nets are very important in terms of signal integrity. A glitch on a clock net will cause an additional clock edge, as we mentioned before. Slow transitions will cause deteriorated setup hold time and registers. Flash, uh, fast transitions are strong aggressors to neighboring nets. So clock nets are really important. And therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to usually pre-route the clock nets during CTS. So we're going to do a routing stage during CTS just for the clock nets where we have first choice of all the routing tracks. None of the routing tracks are taken except for the uh, pre-routes that we did for power and so forth. Uh, second, we're going to use higher and thicker metals for clock routing because they have lower resistance and less capacitance to the substrate. It's really nice. Um, next thing, we may apply, apply clock shielding, shielding. So, for example, if we take a, a clock net here, we can put shields of VDD and ground on all sides. Usually, we're going to do it actually on um, the, the, the sides up here because we can have more interlayer dielectric up and down, and we don't necessarily have to do it on top and on bottom. And this will make sure that any signals that are routed on the sides will not be uh, disrupted or will not disrupt the clock signal. So we're going to do that actually usually only on the higher, on the bigger, higher, more major clock nets and less on the lower ones, but um, uh, that's something we're going to do. Um, next, we're going to consider adding decaps next to clock buffers. So, um, for example, we have a uh, okay, we have a clock buffer over here, and we want it to behave really nicely. But of course, uh, here's a power supply somewhere, and we have some sort of an R over here until it gets to the power supply. So this IR drop is not very great, and we want to have a really nice clock transition. So what we can do here is add some decap over here. Uh, Excuse me, that's not a good picture. Uh, decap over here, which provides the extra um, uh, charge to this clock buffer, even if there's a, uh, a, a current being driven to the rest of the, the net. So what we're going to do uh, sometimes is we're going to add padding to clock buffers. So this area is going to be like a type of a blockage that can then be used to I I insert uh, decap cells. And we can do it on clock buffers. We can do it on flip-flops uh, next to the, um, the clock inputs of them.
So how do we do this routing of the clock trees in uh, Cadence? Uh, what we do is in Inovus we can define something called special routing rules. Okay, they're called non-default rules or NDRs. Uh, an example of a non-default rule is double width, double spacing. These actually are sometimes provided inside the tech left. So they're already going to have like a double width, double spacing, triple width, triple spacing type of a rule that you can use already inside the left or we can define it as we'll see on the next slide. Okay, then we can tell Inovus to use a certain NDR by creating what's called a routing type. Okay, a routing type enables us to de uh, define preferred layers and shielding. And then in Inovus, we have for clock nets three different distinct types of clock nets. We have top clock nets. These are initial branches of the clock tree. A top net has some sort of threshold. So only clock nets that have over 10,000, I believe, um, uh, sinks to them are defined, are, are, are recognized as a top net. Next, we have trunk nets, which are the next level of nets. And if we don't have 10,000, but we still have a lot of uh, uh, fan out, these are the main branch of the clock tree. So the top nets are going to be very wide and very high. And the trunk nets are also going to be wide and high. Um, finally, we'll have the leaf nets. These are the bottom levels of the clock tree, and they should be closer to the logic because they're going to have to have, um, you know, via stacks, and there are going to be a lot more of them. So we'll put them at lower, a bit lower um, routing levels, and we may not use uh, shielding on them. So we're going to define NDRs and routing rules that apply to clock nets, such as the examples we can see over here on this slide. So first, we're going to define these NDRs. Again, they may be given in the left may be in left so we might not need to actually define this okay but if we need to what we're going to do is for example we're going to make a, a rule named cts double width double spacing to w2s so we do it with create route rule give it a name and we're going to say spacing multiplier 2 with multiplier 2 that's going to make say that we are going to uh, require a drc of double spacing and double width on uh, on nets that we give them the routing rule cts 2 w2s then we're going to create a routing type. So creating create routing type, we're going to call it CTS trunk. So this is going to apply to the trunk nets. Okay. It says which non-default rule to use. Well, this one that we just defined here, CTS to W2S. Then we can say, listen, route it in the top layer, uh, M7, M6. So route it between M7 and M6 and use VSS as a shield for it and uh, put that uh, underneath on M6. That's a type of a, uh, of a way to define that I want to um, route a certain type of net. We haven't said which nets, but if we tell a net that we want to uh, route it with the CTS trunk route rule, then it's going to have shielding in layer M6 on VSS, and it's going to be routed between M6 and M7, plus it's going to be double width, double spacing. Okay, now that we've defined this route type, we can assign this route type to certain types of nets. And for example, if we want it to be applied to all the, um, the trunk nets, we're going to say set DB CTS route tr type trunk and CTS trunk, which is the name we gave over here. So this correlates with this. This is a predefined um, uh, setting inside uh, Inovus, which says that uh, for trunk uh, uh, clock nets, uh, apply a certain route type. Okay, you can apply um, CTS trunk to any other given net as well, but for uh, trunk uh, clock nets, this is something that's built in. Okay, that may have been a bit um, confusing, but you'll have to see it inside the scripts. I just wanted to give you an overview of how it's done. Okay, how do we analyze the clock tree? So before running clock tree synthesis, we should look at each uh, clock tree and understand what the clock root is. Obviously, we need to know where it's coming from, what the desired clock uh, sinks and exceptions are, what we want to add is or remove is, stop pins, ignore pins, uh, etc. Okay, whether the clock tree contains pre-existing cells such as clock gating cells, this is really going to affect us. We need to make sure that our clock propagates through our clock gating cells, maybe where the clock is sourced from and so forth. Whether the clock tree converges either with itself, a convergent clock path, or with another clock tree, an overlapping clock path, this can affect our skew balancing and so forth. Whether the clock tree has timing relationships with other clock trees in the design, such as interclock skew requirements, and that can be important if we have like a divided clock and two clocks that talk to each other. What the DRV constraints are, the max fan out, transition time, capacitance, maybe even max length, and we should set them in our clock tree script. And what are the library cells to use for implementing the clock tree? We should be using balanced cells for implementing it. Finally, what are the routing constraints? We have to define the routing rules and metal layers, as I showed uh, on the previous slide. So all these things we should do before starting our clock tree synthesis.
So what is the tool going to do to optimize the clock tree? Let's see, it, say it built a clock tree uh, as so. We have this uh, 4x driver here that's divided into three nets. We have here a 3x driver, a 2x driver, and we have some logic gate, an AND gate that for some reason is over here that's 4x, and this is driving three flip-flops, this three flip-flops, this four flip-flops. What types of optimizations can the tools do? So they're pretty trivial, I would say, but it can change the sizing of the buffer over here. Let's say it can upsize it to better meet um, the skew requirements. Okay, we can size not only buffers, but we can also size gates if we have uh, logic gates on here. We can insert delays, so we can insert some sort of uh, 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 two inverters to, or two buffers to, to delay the clock path that gets over to here. Right? We can relocate the buffer, so if this buffer was in a place that caused a, uh, a worse uh, type of skew, we can move it, and we can also move the gate over here. And finally, we can apply useful skew, where in this case we have a long path that takes up um, 12 time units versus this takes up only 8. We can add two uh, time units of uh, useful skew over to here, and we uh, balance these so each of them take basically 10 time units. Just something I want to mention is uh, an issue that we have with post-CTS interface timing. So before CTS, of course, the clock was ideal, and we defined these I.O. constraints, set input delay and uh, uh, set output delay. Sorry, here's a mistake. Um, set output delay. And what that did is it defined kind of what we expect, the what we want the tool to um, uh, do over here and what we want the tool to do over here, assuming what kind of delay we have before and after until we get to some sort of a virtual flip-flop outside the design. Um, the problem is that after CTS, we get skew over here on the inputs. And what the skew does is, it means that we, we have this virtual flip-flop over here that gets uh, uh, virtually gets the same clock, but the skew, uh, the, the insertion delay to this guy is zero. And so what we did actually is we added skew between this input, uh, this, um, this register at the input, to this virtual register that was over here, and that added positive skew on this um, on this uh, um, uh, path, which uh, of course helps us uh, for setup timing and maybe can hurt us for hold timing. Um, similarly, on the out paths, we we have skew over here. So um, what the skew means is that the clock gets over to here after some sort of delay, but our uh, virtual type of register that's over here gets us at uh, zero. So the clock reaches this virtual output or this virtual register much later than the clock reaches this guy, and that's negative skew on our output um, path, which means that it's harder to meet our uh, requirement that we had before. Plus. It also means that uh, we might have a, a easier time fixing hold. Neither of those are good. So um, the what do we do? Um, as I mentioned when we discuss SDCs, one of the things is just to say set max delay over here. And that uh, uh, if we do a max delay instead of an input or output delay, then um, we we get a something that's um, that doesn't have anything to do with the skew on the clock and so forth. If we kind of know what we can do, we want to do, we can put a max delay. Um, the other thing that is done uh, currently, in at least in the cadence tools, is that they take the average insertion delay to all the pins here, and they um, add that basically to this and this flop. And if we have the average insertion delay, we kind of offset these skews, at least in the average and the median case. Okay, um, so just a couple of ways that we can go and reduce some clock distribution problems, and there's a lot of research on this type of stuff. We can use latch-based design. So in latches, we have one of the phases, the latch is opaque. That means you can do what you call time borrowing, where you can borrow time from a previous stage into this one. Um, it's rarely used in fully synthesized ASICs uh, because uh, it's kind of complex, and digital designers tend to be scared of latch-based um, timing, but it is sure, for sure doable, and it can help alleviate clock uh, skew problems. Okay, we can make uh, logical uh, partitioning match physical partitioning. It limits uh, global communication where skew is usually the worst and helps break distribution problems into smaller sub problems. We can uh, apply advanced things such as uh, GALS, globally asynchronous, locally synchronous design, where the, the design is divided into these synchronous blocks, which uh, have some low skew between them, and all the um, interfaces between them will be asynchronous interfaces. And we can use fully asynchronous design, which is um, a certain approach that has been applied often in research to try and reduce this, this whole problem of clocking.
So just as some addition, we'll have two uh, more subjects. The first one will be a short um, discussion of clock generation. So where does the clock actually come from? The easiest way to generate a clock is by using a ring oscillator. So if we take a bunch of inverters, an odd number, of course, let's say three inverters, and we connect them back and forth, we have zero, one, zero causes a one. That means that this becomes a zero, and this becomes a one, and then this becomes a zero. Right, and so forth, and we have this type of an oscillation that makes some sort of a nice uh, clock um, signal. However, um, this type of a ring oscillator is really, um, really susceptible to process vari variations, process voltage and temperature variations, and we want some sort of a frequency that we know about because we have to meet our setup uh, and hold delays and we have to meet our spec. Okay, so therefore clocks are generally generated off chip using a crystal, okay, and some sort of oscillation circuit, and that's because crystals have a very nice, uh, um, they can make a very nice and stable frequency. But um, usually we can only use one crystal and uh, one off-chip clock, and that's because they take up a lot of room in the, on the board and so forth. And so we get one single frequency, and we may need several frequencies on the clock. Uh, not only that, the frequency is usually limited to around 100 megahertz because it's hard to drive that clock onto the chip. So what we usually need to do is have on-chip on local clock generation, um, usually using what we call a PLL or a DLL. So we'll take this external clock, which is made from the crystal, and we'll have to have some sort of local clock generator, usually like a PLL, and then we'll distribute it on the clock as we discussed throughout this whole lesson. So let's discuss local clock generation. So there are two big problems that we have with these external, uh, generally, uh, uh, externally generated clock. First, first of all, frequency is limited. Okay, so if we can only bring up to say 100 megahertz and we need a one gigahertz clock, we need a clock multiplier. And clock multiplication is not uh, very trivial. We usually need some sort of analog type of a circuit to do it. Second of all, um, we don't know anything about the clock phase. And if we need to have communication, right, if we have uh, two chips that need to talk to each other, then we have a problem communicating because uh, we have no clue about the clock phase that gets to the two of them. Okay, so um, to do this, we use a PLL to fix this problem. So we have our crystal oscillator here, and it drives uh, this uh, type of a clock, uh, 100, maybe a bit more than that megahertz, uh, and it gets into the PLL. The PLL will uh, multiply the clock, and it will provide it into our system, and it may divide it or something like that to bring it out to a reference clock. Um, now we have some sort of path that goes between our system and between uh, uh, another chip. And what we need to do is we need to have a path between them, but these are asynchronous, they don't know, or uh, they don't know anything about each other. So this clock divider will go into the PLL, will fix the phase between them, and that will enable us to have a synchronous path between the two. Okay, so that will uh, fix the phase between them, and then we can, um, uh, we can communicate between these two types of systems. Okay, um, if uh, clock multiplication is not required, we can use a delayed lock loop instead. It's a more simple solution that just delays the clock in order to um, uh, fix the, the phase difference. So how does a PLL work? So this is a kind of a, uh, a schematic uh, uh, description of a PLL. So we get some sort of input uh, clock, we may divide it, um, and we have a return path from our output clock that also comes into it, and we detect the phase difference between them with a phase detector. Okay, This phase detector is driven into a loop filter, which converts the phase error into a control signal, a voltage, and the voltage is driven into an oscillator or a voltage-controlled oscillator, a VCO. Um, so depending on this error between the two, which is con uh, converted into a voltage, it makes the uh, frequency of the oscillator changed. This is driven into these clock buffers, which then drive it back here, and this um, conti it continues until we lock on the same phase, and there is no phase error, and that's where the new output clock that is uh, at the size of n divided by m. So we get multiplication as well in this way. Uh, a DLL is the same principle, but instead of changing the frequency, it just delays the clock until the phase is equal. So to end our discussion of clock tree synthesis, I just wanted to mention one additional subject, that is clock domain crossing, or CDC. So most system on chips have several components that communicate, communicate with different external interfaces and run on different clock frequencies. In other words, they have multiple asynchronous clock domains. Okay? 
It's very important to understand that asynchronous clock domains cannot communicate with each other in a straightforward fashion. So just as an example here, we have two flip-flops. One's running on clock A and the other one's running on clock B and we have this um, node in the middle called DA. And what we have here is clock A is running at this frequency, clock B is running at a different frequency, and there's some phase difference between where we decided the starting point uh, was, which causes a phase difference between each and every clock edge of these two, uh, two clocks. And that phase difference can be arbitrary because these are completely asynchronous. So in the case uh, of DA changing here, so DA rose over here, and anyway, it fell at this point. And it fell due to the rising edge of clock A. When clock A went up, we had D go over to DA, and this was this falling edge over here. And that was fine, but it happened to be that DA fell exactly when clock B was rising. That means we had a uh, setup violation, and due to the setup violation, we had some metastability here, and DB did some sort of a weird uh, type of a metastable state until it finally settled at one of the stages somewhere along the clock cycle. That is something that we don't want to happen, this type of a metastability state. So our problems with CDC are several. And the main one when we're passing data between asynchronous domain is this metastability um, type of uh, effect. Uh, so a setup or hold violation in the capture register can occur, and it may cause high propagation delay at the fan out, high current flow in the chip because we have some sort of a median state that causes short circuit current, and different values of the signal at different parts of the fan out. Um, so this is really strange. It's something that's completely non-digital. It's something that we don't want. Um, let us just make some definitions over here on the side and quickly go over some of the math. You can go in, for example, the CMOS VLSI design. It has a more uh, deeper dive into the math here. But we have something called TW, which is an error window. That's the setup plus hold kind of a, of a window around the clock edge where we're going to get an error if we have some sort of change. Then we have the clock frequency F and the frequency of the data change, which we call F of D. Okay, so now assume that a data D change can come anywhere in the clock cycle relative to the capture clock. So the rate of metastability is F times FD times the timing window. And with the 1 gigahertz clock and an 0.1 um, uh, times the frequency probability of data changing or frequency of data changing and a timing window of 20 picoseconds, we get a rate of metastability of 2 million times a second. Well, that sounds like a, quite a lot of uh, metastable um, points inside our chip. Okay, um, that's not the only problem. Metastability is one problem, but the other two problems basically that we're going to look at are data loss. So new data in the source may be generated without the data being captured at the de destination because we have different frequencies and they're not uh, synchronized with each other. And similarly, we can have data in co coherency where the data may be captured late, causing several coherent signals to be in different states. And that's a very strange situation. So we can have different data running around and get us totally unsynchronized with our um, state machines and our, our different timing paths. Okay, so the first and basic solution is called a synchronizer. And a synchronizer is a real simple solution which is used all over the place on clock uh, domain pa uh, crossing paths. And it's just a, a two flip-flops that are cascaded with each other and they're both co connected to the capture clock. So you see the clock B is, con is connected to this like simple two register shift register over here. And how that helps is that when our DA, our middle signal here, um, changes, it may be um, captured uh, in a violation state and get to a metastable point over here on this internal node of our synchronizer. But um, this is going to dissipate pretty quick. Remember we have this regenerative property of CMOS type of circuits. So this is going to be, even if we get to a metastable state, it's going to quickly go up to one or down to zero. And as long as it does it, less than a one cycle time uh, in less than one cycle time, it'll usually be much faster than that, then the second um, clock uh, edge is going to sample either a one or a zero. It may be not um, coherent with what's going on here, but at least it will be a, uh, a, a real digital signal. Okay. There is, however, a probability that the signal will not settle within the cycle time. It may take more than t amount of time to settle, and then we will have our metastable um, situation over here, which is something that we don't want. So uh, how do we see that? So the probability of metastability um, at this point will be P of T larger than S uh, equals E to the minus S over tau, with uh, tau a certain parameter of the flip-flop. And we want the metastability to dissipate at least T setup before uh, the next clock edge. So uh, failure rate is 
the metastability uh, times the exit criterion, which will be the TW, the window width divided by the clock frequency, times e to the power of T minus T setup over tau. Um, so what we usually uh, de describe this is, is some sort of mean time between failures, or MTBF, which uh, is some sort of parameter that says how much of this probability of metastability are we um, uh, willing to sacrifice? And that will tell us if we have to add, for example, a third flip-flop or maybe even more than that into our synchronizer. And so MTBF is usually one divided by the rate of failure. And in this case, it comes out about 10 to the 24 years. So that's a pretty low mean time uh, between failures and we'll probably be able to live with it. And therefore, usually um, just a two flip-flop um, synchronizer is used on every clock, uh, clock domain crossing uh, point. But the big question is, are synchronizers enough? And the obvious answer is that no. So we took care of metastability. We won't have metastability. But the other two problems that I mentioned, data loss and data inc incoherence, are still obviously there. That is something that we need to design our logic to take care of. So we need to make sure that it will take at least two clock cycles or or something like that to have the data pass between um, the two domains. Um, to eliminate data loss, usually we have to look at if we're going from a slow clock to a fast clock, or a fast clock to a slow clock, or the two clocks are equal, and uh, are equal frequency. So when we go from a slow to a fast clock, we won't usually use any data because we'll be sampling several times within uh, one change of data on the slow clock. But when we go from a fast clock to a slow clock, we're gonna have to hold the source data for several cycles to make sure it reaches the other side yeah, on time to be used. For data coherence, we need a, a lot more thinking. That's uh, to just make sure that everything is really happening um, uh, coherently uh, along the chip. And usually that's going to uh, take us to different asynchronous in interfaces. So one of the things is uh, handshake protocols where we ask the other side if it's ready, if it's received the data, if it knows what's going on before we actually remove the data and put on a new piece of data. Or a, a, a very common way to use it is a FIFO interface where we have some sort of an asynchronous FIFO and it gets a, a different clock on each side. One of the clock writes into the FIFO, the other clock reads out of the FIFO, and therefore we don't have any clock domain crossings directly. They all go through this buffer. Um, other solutions are using gray code multiplexers, and there are different ways to do it. Uh, it's a big subject, and, it's, uh, not, and I'm not going to go into it any further in this course. So that was basically the end of our discussion of clock tree synthesis and clocking in general. And here are a bunch of um, uh, references that I use, and you're very much encouraged to go and look further into this.